First off, there is a small sliver of a chance that some of the ideas in this clip can be called controversial. Imagine that you are living in a house with a woman named Beatrice. The house has two stories, plus a basement. You are wondering if she is in the house right now. So you start searching for her. And so far you searched one floor, for instance the ground floor, and you haven't found her. The claim is that the probability that she is in the house has now decreased. This wouldn't be so interesting if it weren't for the principles it illustrates. As usual we got an observation and we've got something unobserved that we're wondering about. Uh, the unobserved proposition is often called a model and uh, in order to find the probability for the model given the data we need the probability for the data given the model called the likelihood. Often the likelihood given such a model can be hard to come by. In such cases we divide the model into smaller disjunct models where we have a better understanding of the data probabilities. So our model is really a family of smaller submodels. Let's call the unobserved big model M and the smaller components M1 to for instance M3, which are the submodels. And we allow ourselves to contemplate that there are models outside of the big model M. Let's call that collection N, which is simply not M. The claim is now that having a submodel falsified is bad business for the model. More specifically, if model family M is uncertain to begin with and one of its submodels, let's call it M1, which is also in the realm of uncertainty, is falsified, the probability for the big model decreases. This is simply the principle in clip 3 used for negative statements. As you may remember, if we have two statements, let's call them A and B, and if A implies B and you observe B, then A becomes more probable. You can now identify A with the alternative model M, uh, while the observation B is now M1 has been falsified, or simply not M1. Clearly, N is equal to not M implies not M1, and that's the proof really. In the house example, M1 would be the proposition that Beatrice is on the ground floor. The other two models are M2, she's on the first floor, and M3, she's in the basement. This subdivision of the model Beatrice is in the house, M, which is equal to M1 or M2 or M3, makes it easier to work with observations on one floor. Each model says that the probability for finding her on that floor is 1 if she's there, and 0 if not. The principle that falsification of a submodel reduces the model probability is not hard to see, using our graphical representation. Here I represented the submodel, uh, which later will be falsified, M1, as a corner in the space of possibilities. The reason will become apparent. Model M1, M2 and M3 are all submodels of M, while model N is outside the union, i.e. the complement of M. If we now learn that M1 is false, we learn that not M1 is true. The probability for not M, that is N, can be found by applying the definition of conditional probability where we simply zoom in on the part of the set of possibilities we condition on. And there we go, the probability for N increases and the probability for M decreases. Algebraically, we use Bayes' formula, but this will only be a repetition of the stuff in clip 3, so I will avoid describing it. Just note that the only way the probability for M stays the same is if M is a priori certain, or if the falsified submodel M1 is a priori not possible. The principle gets even more interesting, if possible, because we often set out to falsify the most probable of the submodels first. If you were searching for Beatrice, you would start with the floor where she is usually found. The greater the probability for M1, the greater the fall for model M when M1 is falsified. Somehow, fairly smart people have a problem with the principle shown in this clip. I've heard statements like, OK, this submodel of my favorite model has been disproven, but that doesn't mean that my model is false, nor can you say that the probability for my model has decreased. The first part of the statement is correct, but simply says that uncertain is uncertain and indicates an unwillingness to do reasoning under uncertainty. 
The second part is, as I've shown, false. Unless that individual has given his model an a priori 100% chance of being correct, or the submodel M1 a 0% chance of being correct. Others may anyhow disagree with such a strong assumption. The failure to update one's model probabilities is what lies behind some erroneous thinking uh, associated with ad hoc hypothesis adjustments. Having to find an ad hoc solution to a model problem isn't a terminal condition in itself for that model, um, but it is an indication of weakness and should be treated as such. If you've got a favorite model, a favorite submodel of that model, and that submodel is disproven, uh, the erroneous way to deal with ad hoc rate consists in adjusting the model without decreasing the probability. Often this is followed with another erroneous reasoning, uh, namely that since the model now fits the data well, uh, this is an indication of model strength. This is using data twice, uh, which I will deal with an, in another clip. If your model needs tweaking and another model does not, your model has decreased in probability. More generally, model fitting will usually change the model probability, though exceptions exist. As for clip 3, the assumption in the principle shown here can be relaxed, which is a good thing because total falsification is an ideal, not something you would realistically expect from data. The basic assumption is that the data simply says that not M1 is true. The data should be so that the probability for it should be the same under all other models considered. For instance, the probability for not finding Beatrice on the ground floor is the same if she's in the basement, on the first floor or out of the house. In this case, these likelihoods are equal to 1. We can keep the last bit about the probability for the data being same for all the other models, but relax the assumption that the data likelihood is 0 for model M1. Instead, the likelihood under M1 may simply be less than the likelihood under M2, M3 and N. For instance, Beatrice may be on the ground floor, but you've happened not to find her. Because your eyes are playing tricks on you, your mind is playing tricks on you, Beatrice is playing tricks on you by hiding, Beatrice is a secret CIA agent trying out her new invisibility cloak, or Beatrice is a ninja who's practicing her skills by stalking behind you. But she is missing her opportunity to practice her killing skills on you. So that's very improbable. And to my knowledge, so are the rest of the scenarios. So the assumption is now that the probability for the data given M1 is less than the probability for the data given M2 or M3 or N. Also, the probability for the data is the same for M2, M3, and N. As you can see from this algebraic exercise, the result still stands. A few classifiers at the end. Classifier 1. This has been yet another example of how probabilities change in a particular direction when a certain class of new data arrives. However, a decrease in probability does not necessarily mean that the model has become improbable. It could even mean something like the probability has decreased from 99.99% to 99.98%. Classify 2. The probability for the data should be smaller for one of the submodels than the rest. The probability for the data given any of the other submodels or the complementary model should be equal. If the likelihood is different for the different models, then you can no longer apply the lessons in this clip. In the example, I was thinking about uh, calling it a building rather than a house, and uh, calling the person you're looking for Elvis rather than Beatrice. Uh, the question was then if Elvis was in the building, or if he had, you know, left it. Yes, my humor is atrocious.